Here's another episode of the Hall of Shame, where I highlight really awful games that take the Steam Early Access business model and really just wipe their asses with it. Frankly, I don't think that the Hall of Shame would really be complete without this game, Goddess. And while technically the game is still in development, I don't think that anyone would really call me cynically premature when I bestow my dubious honor upon it. So feast your eyes upon Goddess. As a game being designed by longtime game developing veteran Peter Molyneux, much was expected of Goddess based on Molyneux's pedigree and the promises made during the Kickstarter campaign. Unfortunately, it's those very promises as well as what could be called rank mismanagement that turned the once promising Goddess into a gaming equivalent of a dumpster fire. On November 21st, 2012, the Goddess Project was launched on Kickstarter and gained approval for their project on December 21st, 2012, with just over a half million pounds of funding, which at the time was worth about $700,000 to $800,000 or so. Just looking back on the Kickstarter, it's painfully obvious that there was a great deal of stress at the studio about the possibility that their goal might not be met. Check out this status video from Peter himself. Good afternoon, or evening, as the case may be. Uh, with 11 days left, I thought today we should give a status update. It's getting pretty scary, scary now and pretty serious. We are desperate to get a prototype out to everyone in the world so you can really see how wonderful this game is. I get it why people or some people aren't pledging. They aren't pledging because they can't see the game. So we're currently working really hard to finish off our prototype. Now, to my innocent mind, this prototype should have been developed before hitting the Kickstarter path. Maybe things would have gone smoother and the funding would have been much less stressful for them. At the very least, it wouldn't have resembled the chaotic phone bank of a public broadcasting station during Pledge Week, as this atmosphere surely does. I think it's worth noting that they didn't have the said prototype video finished until three days before their Kickstarter campaign had completed. In any event, in a panic, Peter decided to promise anything in order to get people to pledge. Mac support, Linux support, multiplayer, multiple worlds to conquer, the ability to start your own sect and give commandments, swimsuit models and cocaine, every conceivable thing to get those quote, fence sitters, end quote, to pledge. That's not just my conjecture. He admitted to as much in a piece on Tech Radar, and I quote, <clears throat> There's this overwhelming urge to overpromise because it's such a harsh rule. If you're one penny short of your target, then you don't get it. And of course, in this instance, the behavior is incredibly destructive, which is, quote, Christ, we've only got 10 days to go and we need to make 100,000 pounds. For fuck's sake, let's just say anything, end quote. So I'm not sure I would do that again. Peter's desperation is palpable even in the game itself as it exists right now. His own disembodied voice gives you occasional explanations to each card you unlock and milestone you reach. He's even going to give us explanations as to why some features are missing. Frankly, in-game tutorials would have worked better, but Peter's lectures and soliloquies offer an interesting insight into the game itself. Just listen to the intro. Hello, uh, welcome to Goddess, the PC version. Uh, this is Jack and I going to be doing a uh, developer com commentary, explaining some of the features, explaining why they're not finished, explaining our thoughts behind them. You can always turn off our slightly aggravating voices, especially um, mine. if you're, well, I don't know about yours, mine's more gravelly. Um, we do recording this in the studio, so if you hear any weird noises behind or swearing, we apologize uh, in advance. Authentic. Yeah. So, here we go. Um, uh, we're going to do... These, these commentaries are going to come across as you unlock features in the game, and we're going to explain what those features are. We're doing this while we're playing through, so this is kind of an honest uh, account of uh, what's going on. You can always, as I said, turn us off in the settings menu. <clears throat> Let's do it. Click to continue. 
Here we are at the start of the game. Um, the first thing we wanted to do is to give you a feeling of connection with your two followers. Now, this is something that we're going to be working on over the forthcoming months. Um, I, I, I like this very simple beginning. I love the idea that everything that's going to come from this, you, uh, you should remember this first moment where you only had two followers. With each of his monologues, I can't shake the feeling that Peter wants me to play this game his way, not my way. This is no sandbox in which I am truly God. This is a grand spectacle envisioned by Peter Molyneux in which I am little more than a maintenance man in a mostly linear gameplay experience. When I shirk the next task that the Grand Ringmaster has assigned, the game itself reminds me incessantly to go do the next little thing. I can't get away from the pestering no matter how far I scroll. Look at how it follows me around like an annoying salesperson at a mall kiosk, just because I have the temerity to ignore its attention. He says it himself in a particularly telling in-game sermon. The world itself was carefully designed to encourage a certain style of gameplay. The base game itself isn't that bad, it's just lacking a lot of features that would make it a good PC game. It's decidedly mediocre, shackled by its obvious origins as a mobile-capable game. Your god powers are generally fueled by belief. Larger and more developed buildings and settlements naturally produce greater amounts of belief than smaller ones. The belief collects over each abode in these pink blobs that hover over the buildings. Since this is essentially a mobile game, you're constantly scrolling the screen around to click each of the buildings to collect belief rather than having it fill a meter. This becomes a pain in the ass early in the game, as you're having to do a lot of scrolling to collect your belief so you can keep sculpting lands for your followers to settle in. Peter tells us that this mechanic exists because he likes the idea of us revisiting our origins and roots. I find this consideration, frankly, to be irrelevant and tedious. I don't want to constantly gaze at my earlier shanties in order to build new structures and do my god powers. I find myself sculpting the land a great deal, because I like to try and set up a living area for my people that will yield the most belief in the shortest amount of time, and the people and goddess don't live on hillsides. I enjoy mostly peaceful building games anyway, so this can be actually pretty fun, and the land sculpting mechanic is fairly well done, and I say only just fairly. Unfortunately, the sculpting mechanic is sometimes a little buggy, and it really needs refinement. The game will sometimes grab the wrong layer, which is a problem because sometimes sculpting will cost belief. So if you're trying to sculpt the sand for free and grab some grass you didn't want to move, you're wasting your energy. This is particularly bad in the water, and it doesn't always work very well. In Peter's incorporeal droning, he seems very sensitive to the criticism that the player would be waiting around a lot to get things done on the PC version. You know, like you would in a free-to-play mobile game that wants you to spend money to speed things up. His response, however, is just to point out that you should just go do something else instead of wait around, or you can spend your gems. The mobile and PC versions of the game are so similar that the mobile in-game currency still exists in the PC version. Here's the in-game introduction to gems, again presented with a barely hidden desperation permeating the whole process. Okay, Pit of Doom. This is the first PC exclusive feature and it unlocks gems. Now here's the thing. We, I love as a designer the concept of gems. The gems on the PC are very, very different to gems on mobile. Gems on the PC allow you to use your skill to uh, find and collect and hoard gems, and then using those gems on different areas of the game. If you want things to go faster, if you want a building to go faster, you can do that. If you want to give your followers gifts, you can do that. If you want to... Um, go through voyages quick uh, with more followers you can do that gems really allow you to use your impatience or your curiosity to uh, mod the game they're not something to be frightened about now you'll notice on the pc as well there's no way of buying gems with money we don't want you to buy m with money you've already spent your money on this game we want to use your skill as a gamer to collect as many gems as possible now, there's two approaches to gems. The first approach 
is a turtle approach. I am a turtle. I like collect hoarding stuff and feeling rich. So collecting as many gems as you as you can, but don't spend them unless you feel that you absolutely have to. The second approach is the spendthrift approach, and that means you, as soon as you get a gem, you spend it. Your average, average on the on average, you'll probably only have four or five gems at any one time, where the turtle will have up to a hundred gems. Don't be frightened of these. These are exciting gameplay features. They've been balanced. This is balanced for you. I would warn you though. If you overspend at the start, you might live to regret it. You're going to get through the game faster than the turtle, but you, you're, you're going to come to a point where you just wish you had more of those gems. Except in the PC version, there's no way to purchase gems. You just need to find them in-game in a variety of ways. One of those ways is to sacrifice your population in the Pit of Doom, Another PC exclusive feature where you just dump people into the pit to get gems. It lowers their happiness significantly, which is important in regard to your rivals. Speaking of which, there's a rival tribe in the world in another PC exclusive. They're called the Astari, and they're essentially little douchebags who tease your people, conduct ineffectual raids, and have a festival every so often. The festival is important because when it ends, the Astari happiness is compared with your people's happiness. If they're happier, some of your people will defect to them. The opposite is true if your people are happier than the Astari. Then you'll gain some Astari followers who are absolutely worthless. So making sure that the Astari are glum becomes pretty much a priority for you. And it makes using the Temple of Doom something that you'll want to think twice about as sacrificing just a few followers has a, a really deplorable effect on your morale. Luckily, and I have to say I really hate to admit this, it's actually great fun to abuse the Astari. Inflicting swamps on them and squishing them is almost endless entertainment. And since there's currently a bug in the game, the swamps never go away. <laughs> so it's pretty easy to turn their area of the world into a veritable charnel house. And they conveniently don't build new buildings or expand, they just hold their festivals every so often which is a good opportunity to crush a few more of them or set fire to something. An especially fun thing to do is to use your fist power to set fire to the forest surrounding their village, then crush the ones that come out to extinguish the fire. Anyway, if you're doing your job properly, the festival will come and go with the Astari mourning their dead and you'll gain some Astari followers, who only make it to your settlement about half the time, I'm not sure where they go, but they might drown in the swim over, or they could be bugged and just disappear from the world forever. They'll raid your people every so often, but it's pretty easy just to squish them before they get to their destination. One time they set fire to one of my buildings, but that was only because I was in the other room to get something to eat, and I was letting the game run in my absence. They had done such little damage when I got back that I was able just to crush them all before a single building was destroyed. Every so often a huge rainstorm batters the landscape. Because nothing reminds a gamer that the world they're playing in is real like random weather effects. And in a god game, nothing reminds the player that they're no god like weather effects that they can't change or affect at all. Peter Molyneux is the real god here, not the player. The weather's inclusion in the game kind of makes me scratch my head a little. I mean, my reading through the patch notes indicates that the rainstorms may signal respawning of the chests. There's also a power maybe later in the game that you can control the frequency of these storms. But the, to be really frank with you, the 22Cans website is so poorly laid out that the year isn't included with any of their patch notes or future plans. And that makes it pretty difficult to see where they promised what features since the game has been dragging on for years past its intended launch. There's a lot of theatrics in the game that add polish but not gameplay. Your people idle under trees, wander around chit-chatting, and do other daily activities while you gaze down at them. If you plant trees around their houses, they rush out to look at them and to worship them. They gaze with curiosity at your sculpting activities in ways that really make the world feel alive, and like your actions are actually affecting these people. <laughs> Unfortunately, the mundane tasks of clicking around to gather up your belief and gather your crops or instruct your followers to build more housing, it really pulls you out of the immersion scarcely after it's begun. And 
again, you're reminded that you're just a glorified janitor here playing a glorified mobile game. It really is too bad that the clicking mechanic wasn't scrapped early, but Peter desperately clung to it, not only to the game's detriment, but to its ruination. And he tried so many things to make this constant chore more palatable to the player. It's unbelievable. You can hold down the mouse button and scroll around, collecting the belief in large, fell swoops. But the scrolling mechanic is kind of loopy and tough to control in this mode. You'll always be overshooting your targets, and it's very frustrating. There's a card you can unlock that allows you to place a statue that automatically collects belief in its radius, but only if you're present. Scroll too far away and it stops working. All this just to avoid scrapping the crappy mechanic of cookie clicking all over the place constantly to keep your powers juiced up. Which you'll be doing because the alternatives don't work very well. Oh, speaking of cards, you'll earn them at certain population farming and mining milestones. Fill the meter and earn a card in that category. Yeah, pretty easy. It's tough to see what categories each card belongs to because they're all in a line here, not arranged in any kind of categories or any other demarcation. Once you discover cards, you can spend stickers on them to earn the power that's on the card. Yep, stickers. You're a god who collects stickers. Or it's the game's way of inadvertently reminding you that you're not a god, you're merely a player with the mentality of a grade schooler. At least, uh, well, I was a grade schooler when I collected stickers with any kind of seriousness, so there's that. Anyhow, you get stickers in a number of ways. Most of the time, you're digging up these chests, some of which look like the Ark of the Covenant, while others look like a wooden biscuit barrel. You look for these sparkly things in the dirt and sculpt them away to see the treasure. You usually get one sticker at a time doing this, which is a bit of a pity since the cards cost at least a half dozen stickers. You might also uncover gems, or these stupid blue chests that give you more chapters in the story about your experiences as God. See, Peter will even narrate to you the very experience you're playing, and it's bugged, so you'll sometimes get the same chapter multiple times. Don't worry though, no worries. You'll stop caring way before you read even a small part of your own story being told back to you. The chests appear randomly and they spawn regularly. They just sometimes appear in the middle of your settlements that you've painstakingly sculpted flat for your followers. The other way to get loads of stickers at once is to go on a voyage of discovery. Or THE voyage of discovery, as there's only one in the game right now. It's a dull, lemmings-like minigame where you get your followers to the temple on each island. You sculpt the land to make a clear lane for them while they just blindly stumble forward, sometimes into these big angry guys so you have to be mindful of the path that your followers are taking. Once you do the first voyage, that's it. It says that there's more on the way, but the last update was over a year ago, so it doesn't look like any additional levels are forthcoming. Speaking of updates... <laughs> The new CEO of 22 Can, Simon Phillips, has declared that Goddess is still going to be worked on, and all the promises are going to get into the game, like combat, the hub world, multiplayer, civilization building, and all that stuff. He promises that it'll leave early access and be a fully released game. However, and here's the thing, in February 2016, one of the head developers' contract wasn't renewed. And in June of 2016, Eurogamer reported that 22 Cans, as well as Peter Molyneux himself, was working 100% on their new game called The Trail. As Eurogamer went on to report in the same article, development on Goddess is essentially ground to a halt. Which is too bad, as the game really feels unfinished as the player reaches the middle game. Here's my middle game homeworld here. You'll notice immediately that the Astari mask is missing from the happiness scale along the right hand of the screen. That's because the Astari were having a little festival, as they do, and I went over to their section of land to abuse and brutalize them, as I do. And I overdid it. I got so carried away in brutalizing the Astari that I wiped them all out, and they're all extinct now on my world. So I guess that I can add genocide to my dubious list of accomplishments that I've achieved in the goddess world. So that's great. So as a result, with no competition to my people, I can just concentrate on sculpting my lands and growing my population. I unlock a few more cards, but 
I lack the stickers to really enable many of them. I go searching for treasure chests to get stickers, but it becomes pretty clear that it will take a small eternity to collect enough stickers out of these chests to get anywhere. I can spend gems to get more stickers, but gems are somewhat hard to come by, and they're not well balanced. For example, a fountain that adds a huge amount to your happiness only costs 10 gems, but renaming a city costs 25 gems. The sticker packs are horrendously expensive, and sometimes contain kind of lousy stickers. And there's no more voyages to go on, and there's no combat or hub world or civilization building. I found this treasure temple and spent a long ass time digging it out. And as you'll see, it was right in the middle of a plateau that I was planning to put some settlements in, so that was a pain in the ass. It was good for a boatload of stickers and gems, but I was disappointed. With the amount of work it took to get it out into the air, frankly I wanted to unlock access to hidden power cards or something like that, because I'm just about out of the ones I can discover, and the undiscovered ones really aren't very interesting. So... You know, after a scant 20 hours of gameplay, I'm pretty much done with everything that Goddess has to offer. And given my lazadaisical gameplay, where I go off on tangents and spend ungodly amounts of time sculpting land and goofing around, I've probably gotten way more time out of it than most people will. In doing research for this video, I saw that there's another world that your people can travel to called Wayland. A realm of almost constant desert, and farming is tough. Which means that expanding your settlements will be a pain in the ass, because expansion relies on you having wheat. Much of the criticism of Wayland center around calling it Waitland, because you have to spend gems like crazy in order to get anywhere. And the gameplay videos I saw made the new land look like just more of the same gameplay, which I'm not interested in. I'm bored with it. And the gamers playing it were spending gems like they were water, many having edited their save game files to give them just short of 100 million gems to play with. Yeah, sounds legitimate to me. Speaking of save game files, there's no way to manage them in-game. If you want to restart the game from scratch, you have to erase or move your save game files. <laughs> now, it's very possible that I might have to retract this video, but it looks pretty likely that Goddess is in an early access limbo and its creators wish that it never existed. And I've hardly scratched the surface of this train wreck, seriously. There's over 50 development videos that are downright comedic given they were made years ago and promise imminent features that still haven't made it into the game. There's dozens of articles in the gaming press about it. Anybody who wants a complete picture of this gaming disaster can certainly learn more. So for the gaming grease stain called Goddess, 22 Cans and Peter Molyneux win the not-so-coveted Hall of Shame award. We love you, Peter. We love you so much.